Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome again. So glad you could join us uh, this morning. We are um, going to be continuing our series that we've been in, the final week of Jesus, and today we land on Tuesday. Uh, but before we get started, let me ask you a question. If you had the chance to ask Jesus any question, like any question in the world, what would you ask him? Would you ask him something that's a little more contemporary, like what's going on with this virus thing? Would you ask him an age old question, like why do bad things happen to good people? What's up with all the suffering and pain in the world? Like what question would you ask him? Maybe you'd go back to like, what was, what was it like to walk on water? Or what was it like to turn water into wine? Maybe some of his miraculous stuff. Maybe you'd go there. You know, I think, as I was thinking about this week, I think the question that I would ask him is, what was it like to be dead and then alive again? I mean, what was it like to wake up and to walk out of the tomb? I mean, that must have been amazing. And then maybe the second question, the follow-up is, what was it like then to encounter people who knew you before you died and then to encounter them after you were raised from the dead? I think I wonder about that. Like, what was the resurrection like? I don't know. There are a lot of interesting things we could ask, but one of the things I know I wouldn't ask is a question about taxes. That is definitely not something that would have any interest to me <laughs> whatsoever. And yet, when we begin our story today, that's exactly the question that the Pharisees or the religious leaders pose for Jesus. Now, they're not really interested in the answer. They're not curious about whether it's right to pay taxes or not. Really, what's behind their question is, can we trap this guy so that we can finally get rid of him because he's become such a nuisance to us that they actually hired spies to pretend to be honest men and ask sincere questions. But this question that they're going to ask in Luke 20 is not an honest question. The idea is, is it right for us to pay our taxes to Caesar? They're thinking to themselves, well, if he says, yes, it's right to pay taxes to Caesar, well, then he's going to look like a Roman sympathizer and he's going to lose his fan base, right? So the crowd that he's had will no longer be there. They'll dissipate because the people are just sick and tired of the Romans ruling over them. So if he answers yes, he'll lose his fans. If he answer, answers no, it's not right, then they're going to report him to the government and he's going to be seized for saying something treasonous. So either way, they think they have Jesus by the jugular. And so as they ask the question, they're ready for him to respond, but he doesn't really answer their question with an answer. He answers as he often does. He answers their question with a question. And his question is, anybody have a coin? And somebody must have handed him a coin probably a denarius. It would be about the size of a dime, I think, that we have today. And he said to them, well, look on the coin, the denarius, worth about a day's uh, wage for a common laborer. He said, look on that. Whose picture is on that? And of course, the picture would have been of the current Caesar, Tiberius, son of Augustus. And he would have said, so, so on that coin is a picture of Tiberius. Yes. And on the front of that coin, it would have said, Divine Son of Augustus. You see, both father and son thought they were gods, and they expected people to treat them like they were. On the back, it would have said, Pontiff Maximus, which would have read, Highest Priest. So he says, whose picture, whose image, what title is on it? And they say, well, it's Tiberius. And he said, well, okay. Then if you have taxes to pay to Tiberius, pay the taxes. He said, but while you've rendered to Caesar what is Caesar's, you need to also to be reminded that you need to render to God what is God's. Give Caesar his taxes, but give God what bears his image. Now you think about that for a second and you say, well, what bears the image of God? The answer is simple, really. What bears the image of God is you and you and you and me. We all bear the image of God. And so the idea is, give Caesar his taxes, but give God your worship. Give him your life, your 
hopes, your dreams, your plans. Give God your skills, your abilities. Give God what he has entrusted to you with your worship. Honor him with your life. And as I hit this point this week, looking at and thinking about this, I just thought to myself, is there anything that I'm holding back from God? I mean, if I'm to give God what is God's, which means my life, is there any area of my life that I'm withholding? Is there something that I just haven't been as faithful with in my worship of God? Sometimes it's easy to make excuses about why we give God certain aspects of our lives, but we hold on to other aspects of our lives. But I just wonder, and I can't answer it for you, this is a place where you just need to stop and say to yourself, like, am I holding anything back? Because Jesus says, we're to pay our taxes for sure. But we're also to give that which bears the image of God back to God, which means our whole heart, our whole life, our whole selves. And really what we need to ask ourselves at this point is, am I doing that? Am I giving everything of who I am? Am I honoring God with the way in which I live, with my conversations, with the way in which I interact with others, in the way that I serve humanity? Am I doing everything that I can to honor God with my life? Give Caesar what is Caesar's, but give God what is God's. And clearly, you and I, we bear the image of God. So are we giving God our best? Well, after he answers the question, uh, what it says is they kind of slinked back into the crowd because they realized that he was wiser than they that they couldn't trap him. And so they just sort of, the way the scripture reads is they just sort of dissipated and backed out and skulked away. Well, the next question, the next group of people that come are the Sadducees. The Sadducees are people who were sort of the religious temple keepers. They were um, people who really vehemently didn't believe in the spiritual realm. So therefore they didn't believe in a soul. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in angels or demons or heaven or hell. They didn't believe about, they didn't believe anything other than what they could see or feel or touch. They only believed in the physical realm. And so when they came forward, they had a particular question that they wanted to ask Jesus in the hopes that they would trap him as well. And I just have to stop for a second and say, why do you think the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the temple priests, the religious leaders, why do you think they hated Jesus so much? I mean, even people today, if you were to walk around and talk to somebody and they weren't a believer in Christ, maybe they were a person of another faith. Maybe they were a Muslim. Maybe they were a Jew. Maybe they were a Buddhist. Maybe they had no faith at all. Most of the time when you encounter people, they may or may not believe in his claims, but you'll very rarely meet people that hate Jesus, right? Most of the time you'll say, they will say something like, well, he was a good teacher or a prophet or someone who lived a model life, but they would never say, I hate him, I want, I want to get rid of him, but, but this group of people did. And why they did, I don't know. Maybe, maybe because they were embarrassed. Maybe because they were presenting themselves as the real deal, but when he came and taught, he sort of exposed them for who they were. He exposed them for the shallow way in which they tried to just present themselves in a certain fashion on the outside, but on the inside they were corrupt. And his life and his model and his teachings, it just, it exposed them. Maybe they were just embarrassed. Or maybe they were just jealous. I mean, huge crowds would follow him from town to town, just wanting a piece of him. And maybe they just wanted a little bit more of that crowd. Maybe they wanted their 15 minutes. Maybe they wanted more than what they were getting. Maybe they were just jealous. I don't know. Could be they were afraid. Maybe they thought that with this man's teachings and his gospel as it was presented with power, that there was very poss- there was the very possibility that with this movement, that this insurrection against Rome was going to be um, toppled and it was going to create great bloodshed. Maybe they were afraid of Jesus and his power. I don't know. Maybe they were embarrassed, maybe they were jealous, maybe they were afraid, but the truth of the matter is they hated him and they just wanted to get rid of him. So the Sadducees come 
And they approach him with this just incredibly ridiculous scenario. It reads as follows, beginning in verse 27. It says, Then Jesus was approached by some of the Sadducees, the religious leaders who say there's no resurrection from the dead. And they said to him, Teacher, Moses gave us a law that if a man dies, leaving a wife but no children, his brother should marry the widow and have a child who will carry on the brother's name. Well, suppose there were seven brothers. The oldest one married and then died without children. So the second brother married the widow, but he also died. And then the third brother married her, and this continued with all seven of them who died without children. Finally, the woman also dies. So tell us, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? For all seven were married to her. So there's this law in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 25, if you want to check it out later. It's called the Leveret Law. And the deal is, if a guy is married and he has brothers and he passes away, the way the law goes is the next oldest in line is supposed to marry his widow. The reason for this is because it continues the family name and the family line, and it also provides protection over properties and things like that. So the scenario that the Sadducees give is, so say this guy has seven brothers. He dies, and then the next brother in line, according to the law, marries the widow, and then he dies. And then so on and so forth down the line. Second brother, third brother, fourth brother. This sounds like a black widow, man. She's really piling through this group of brothers here. But by the time she gets to the end of the seven brothers, she finally dies. I mean, whew. And so the question is, so in heaven, in the afterlife, who's she going to be married to? It's a ridiculous question because... Um, things in the life to come and things as they are on earth, they're very different. Again, they didn't believe in heaven. They didn't believe in the afterlife. They didn't believe in anything like that. It wasn't a question of curiosity. It was a question to try and trap him. And so Jesus says, marriage is for people here on earth, but in the age to come, those worthy of being raised from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage and they will never die again. In this respect, they will be like angels. They are children of God and children of the resurrection. So he says, there's really not going to be any need for this kind of thing because in the afterlife, God will be everyone's father. There will be no need for family lineage or passing down of, of any rights or lands or properties. So the way things are now and the way things are to come, they're going to be very different. So your question is moot. It doesn't matter because it's not the same. And then he does something really brilliant because the Sadducees only embrace the first five books of our current Bible, the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It's all they believed in. Okay. So he's going to use an example to teach them about the reality of the resurrection, and then we'll see their response. So Jesus says, But now, as to whether the dead will be raised, even Moses proved this when he wrote about the burning bush. Long after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had died, he referred to the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So he is the God of the living, not the dead, for they are all alive to him. So he takes this Exodus 3 passage, this burning bush passage that they would have known well and that they would have believed in. And he said that when God had this encounter with Moses, he revealed himself as I am. And he told Moses that he was, he is the God of Abraham, is the God of Isaac, is the God of Jacob. I am, he used present tense. He didn't say, I was the God of Abraham, I was the God of Isaac, or I was the God of Jacob. He didn't use past tense, he used present tense. Now the deal is, these dudes had been dead for a very long time. So when he's referring to these people, these patriarchs, these people that they would have held in high esteem, he's referring to them as if they're still alive. The issue is, they've long since been dead. So why is he referring to them in the presence unless there is a resurrection? And so they're stunned. They can't believe that he has taken scripture that they adhere to, that they believe in, 
to prove to them the reality of the resurrection. But that's exactly what he did. He uses God's speaking to Moses in a present tense about people who used to exist, still existing, to prove to them that the resurrection was a reality, not only for them, but for the Sadducees and for those of us who come behind them. And at the end of his response to them, they said, well done, sir. Well said, teacher. And then none of them dared ask him any more questions. It is amazing as we move into this Tuesday of the final week of Jesus, as he's there in the temple teaching most every day, that on this day, moving towards the middle of the week, he is there answering questions, responding to people who are really with no good motive trying to trap him into saying the wrong thing. And every encounter he has with them, he ends up asking them questions that causes them to realize, I wasn't prepared for this. I had no idea how wise he was. I came with my best shot and it wasn't enough. And now they are forced to admit they have nothing else to give. And then they didn't dare ask him any more questions the rest of the week. It's funny, as I think about this, it's very easy to look at this story from the outside. But again, like I always try to do, I'd like for us to think about this story as being part of the story. Putting ourselves in the position of the Pharisees of the Sadducees, because truthfully, we act like them sometimes. There are things that we think and things that we do and ways that we interact with one another in our lives that make me think that sometimes, well, I'm not all that different from them. When I get to the end of this section with the Sadducees where they're asking him this ridiculous question, some silly scenario that shows they have no idea about the difference between this life and the life to come, it just makes me think, do I? I mean, we're going through a really hard time right now. I mean, it is very difficult not to be fixated and focused on the latest news, on the death toll, on every day the increasing numbers of people who are getting this disease and on the projected numbers of people who will. And I think there's probably some portion of our day where we just become so engrossed in our present reality that we don't really live through looking by looking through the lens of a resurrection reality. I think sometimes we live as if this is all there is. But what if there's more? I mean, what if life actually does conquer death? What if the resurrection actually is real, not just for Abraham and Isaac and Jacob or for the Sadducees and those who lived during Jesus' time, but for us? I'm not saying that there aren't things to be concerned about, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't act wisely. I think we should. I guess what I'm saying is, I don't think we should be freaked out. I don't think that we should be living our lives as if this is all there is, because it's not. And sometimes what I find is that when my perspective becomes so narrow that I tend to forget the things that are really important, the things that really root and ground me into being at peace. And so as I think about the last part of this story that we're gonna talk about today, I just, I wonder if as a part of this story, if I don't find myself here in the role of the Sadducee, I'd never call myself that, but I wonder if we're not all that different sometimes. I wonder if sometimes we just live as if this is all there is. And so I just want to challenge you as you process this. I want to challenge you just to think about the lens through which you're looking at your world today. I want to challenge you to consider what the resurrection has to say to you.
about what it means for your life, about what it means for your faith, about what it means for a sense of hopefulness into your future beyond this life. Because I think sometimes, even though we say we believe in the resurrection, I think sometimes we live as if we don't. And so it's a hard time. Be smart. Do wise things. Gather information that you need. But let's, let's temper the anxiety to the point where we're just losing ourselves and losing our ability to see what's important, what's real, what's eternal. That being said, I want to say to you, this story, which is a very old story, is relevant for you and I. I want to challenge you this week as you start to think about it and process it to spend some time there and to consider the questions I've posed for you. Now at one o'clock on Sunday, um, I'm gonna invite you to join us, to join us for a live chat about, about this very story. On Wednesday, I'm also gonna invite you, if you want, um, to hit me up at uh, vrife at gracechristianchurch.com. I'm gonna send an invite via Zoom. I'm gonna send a link out to any and all who want to join us, and we're going to process this together on Wednesday from 6.30 to 7.30. But whether you join us on Sunday or Wednesday or not at all, I just want you to think about what you've heard, and I want you to consider what it means to be part of the story. Shall we pray? Father, I thank you for the wisdom of Jesus. I thank you for the questions he poses. I thank you for the insight. I thank you for the information. I pray that it would lead to transformation. I pray that we would remember that we bear, we bear your image. And I ask that you would help us to be mindful of what it means to render unto you what is yours. I also ask that you would help us to be mindful of what it means to look through the lens of a resurrection reality. Challenge us. Stir us. Help us to become our best selves, even when things are at their worst. And it's in Christ that we pray. Amen. Okay, you guys. Be people of grace and peace. God bless you.